Good evening, I'm John Bonet. I'm the wine editor of the San Francisco Chronicle and the author of The New California Wine. And uh, we are at the Napa Valley Film Festival tonight and uh, I've brought uh, some of uh, Napa's most fun folks and um, the victims of my endless reporting for the book. Um, Tegan Pasalacqua, who's a viticulturist and wine, wine, winemaker at Turley Wine Cellars and for his own new label, Sandlands. And Steve Mathiason and Joel Klein Mathiason, who uh, are from Mathiason Wines. Um, and Steve also being a viticulturist to, uh, to uh, the stars, so to speak. So, um, you guys having fun tonight? We're having a great time. So, um, so, I obviously know what's exciting me in California a ton, but um, so Tegan, what's really exciting you in California? Well, I think the most exciting thing about California is that there are a lot of young folks that are now making their own wine uh, that aren't going out and needing big investments or groups of investors to do what they want to do. People who are making wine on the side in their boss's you know, side room or at a friend's cellar. And I, I think that people are making small scale wine and can still keep a day job. That's probably the most exciting thing in, in California right now. And, and not only are they making their own wine, but they're making the wine that they want to drink. Right. And, and that's, that's really huge because the difference between making wine you want to drink and making wine you think someone else would want to drink right. is the whole difference. And, and the, the, so, I mean, there's so many, the book is the new California wine, but it's not a type of wine. It's, they're all totally different because right. they're all personal expressions of either different sites or different people's visions of what they want, what they want to drink, what they believe in. And so the diversity right now with wine is unbelievable. I agree. Yeah, it's, it's really great. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> and what about Napa? We've talked a ton about Napa, Napa terroir, what, what really is so special about Napa. So like, w where is really exciting to you in the valley right now? Steve? Well, the most exciting place to us personally in the valley is our backyard. <laughs> because we actually managed to, to finally 2006 by our own vineyard as you know and and um, it's not maybe the best terroir in the world but it's the most special terroir because it's ours and we finally gave us a chance to do some of the varieties that we really wanted to do you know Rafosco, Schio Patino, Ribola Gialla obviously you know Cabernet Franc and um, you know Cabernet Franc is not quite as esoteric but you know with the least vineyards we can't really do these things and and everything we're trying, you know, surrounding the vineyard with fruit trees, surrounding the vineyard with berries, and 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 bring, you know, it's. Um, I do believe that those rub off onto the flavors of the wine, and it's also just part of the atmosphere. You know, you know, you you. The last time I checked, making wine's not a get-rich-quick scheme, and so you're doing it because of the passion and the love, and and so having a peach at the end of your grape row, is. Um, there's a satisfaction there that you can't go by. It's just inherent to having the ability to have a place. And so that's where we're excited. Well, and I think the most exciting place still in Napa Valley would be Howe Mountain. And it's just because of the Napa Valley AVA system and how, uh, I don't know, misinformed it is, where Howe Mountain is the one AVA that actually really means something. It has an elevation regulation, it has very distinct soils and very distinct growing se seasons. And I think most other AVAs in Napa, unfortunately, are more political boundaries. And, you know, you think of a place like Oakville and you think of how many like floodplain vineyards there are in Oakville and then how many special vineyards there are on the East Bench and the West Bench. And it really uh, dilutes Oakville as a, as a appellation, in my opinion, because you have so much that isn't what Oakville's known for. So I, I think that thing about Howe Mountain is that Howe Mountain is Howe Mountain, and it's very distinct and has different growing conditions. And it's, you know, the, I know they've upset some people because they can't, you know, be in the, the AVA, but I think it actually is the strongest AVA for that reason. And you make, you make Zinfandel from Howe Mountain. We make Zinfandel, uh, Petit Syrah, we, we also grow some Roussan, and we have some Cabernet from Howe Mountain 
I always like to tell people when you think about how mountain I don't think about the wines we make I mean I think about you know the Beringers and the Duckhorns and all these classic wines that everyone goes wow those are amazing wines and the wines were more how mountain than Merlot you know these were I mean how mountain obliterates the variety when you grow it up there it can be Petit Syrah it can be Cabernet it can be Zinfandel Merlot Grenache and it to everyone it's it's not the variety it's how mountain you think, what do, you, do you think Pritchard Hill should be part of Howell Mountain? How would you differentiate Pritchard Hill from Howell Mountain? Well, Pritchard Hill doesn't re the, reach the high, heights of Howell Mountain. I mean, I think, you know, where Jay Hemingway's vineyard at Green and Red, that should be, you know, to me it's the Chateau Grier of the Napa Valley. It's called Child's Valley. Back to the issue with the Napa Valley Appalachian system, it's called Child's Valley. The vineyards go from 1,200 to 1,700 feet. It's wedged in between Pritchard Hill and uh, Howe Mountain, and it's Child's Valley. I don't know how valley it is when it's at 1,700 feet. And Pritchard Hill, I don't think it should be part of Howe Mountain because I don't believe the soils are the same, and I don't think it has the elevation that you get in Howe Mountain. I mean, you know, a good amount of it's right at the base of what people consider Howe Mountain at 1,500 feet. So... The Chateau Grier of Napa Valley. That's that's good. That, your eternal quote. Yes. That's in the next book. book. <laughs> so so just like quickly tell us about both the wines you're making with Turley and uh, the new project, and then Steve, uh, I'm going to pester you to tell us a little more about Matthias. So the wines we're making with Turley right now, we're making about we're going to in 2012 we're going to bottle 32 different wines throughout California. Uh, about 25 of those Zinfandel one Catalan blend of Old Vine Carignan and Old Vine Grenache from Paso Robles, about five Petit Syrahs, a white wine, and the rest Zinfandels and a Cinso. And basically we work with Old Vines throughout the state, primarily Zinfandel, and basically we work with Old Vines, primarily dry farmed and all primarily organically farmed. So that's kind of more or less what we do for Turley. For my own brand, Sandlands, I'm I, I can't make Zinfandel, but I'm trying to follow in the, what I've learned at Turley, and I'm working primarily with old vines, but with different varieties like uh, Chenin Blanc and Carignan and Grenache, and you know, you kind of have to scour around to find things that work to fit your philosophy. Now, <laughs> 32 wines. So I, I was thinking that we have eight. Well, we have. I think we have ADD with 12 wines. Right. And so 32, okay, Jill was going to um, cut me off at, I thought, maybe like 16 or something like that. Yeah, well, don't think you're going to get to 32. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, so we're, you know, we have our, our you know, we, we tend to make, our wines are, are um, <clears throat> classically styled, good acid, a little moderate alcohol, we really emphasize the freshness, try to, try to find a balance between freshness and richness, but freshness is paramount um love working with different varieties so you know we're, our flagship wine is really our white wine it's a blend of Sauvignon Blanc, Ribola Gialla, uh, Semillon and Tokai Friolano. Uh, Ribola Gialla is from um, Friuli, Italy, in Slovenia area um, and our red is you know classic it's Merlot, Cab Sauve, Cab Franc, Petit Verdot and Malbec and then after that everything is a single vineyard single varietal a couple of different Chardonnays, a Merlot, a Cab Franc, um, but the Cab Franc is not your normal Cab Franc. It's like usually about 11.5% alcohol and very light, more Pinot-like, very aromatic, feminine. We really, with all the wines, we're going for the feminine, more the feminine side of, of, um, of, of the sites and of the varieties. Um, our, um, we love Italian varieties, um, cool climate Italian varieties like Rafosco, Schio Patino, and Rola Gialla. Um, we have a new brand called Tendu, which is a total labor of love because the whole idea with Tendu is to make a wine that an average like plumber or dishwasher can afford to drink. And so um, for that, the fruit's from the Central Valley. It's the price of the fruit allows us to make a real handmade wine, but it's affordable. <coughs> so yeah, Vermentino, yeah, exactly. So the white's Vermentino, the red is Alianico, Barbera, and Montepulciano. But really, for us, 
we've been part, Jill and I have been, Jill, before I, when I was in grad school, Jill was working in sustainable agriculture for the, with the Community Alliance of Family Farmers, working <coughs> early, early on in the farmer's market and the CSA movement in California. And so for us, we grow our own food, fresh vegetables, fresh out of the garden. So the food, the wine is really, um, the balance of the wine, the freshness, the lightness of the wine is to go with fresh, simple, clean produce that you got at the farmer's market or that you grew yourself. And, and it's really a totally different thing than a wine you're gonna, you're gonna get with a big steak with a deep Bernays sauce with mushrooms, you know? It's a very different thing. And so, and so, um, so all of our wines, whether they're Cabernet or Merlot, are really about fresh produce, the stuff that we can, we, we are life here in California, which is where the produce comes from. So I'm kind of amazed Shannon Blanc took this long to, uh, to enter the conversation. Um, you, you have kind of a thing for Shannon Blanc. So, so what, what is it and where, where from your end is there a great Shannon Blanc in California? What, what makes it the thing for California? Well, I think the, the thing about Chenin Blanc is how versatile it is. It, it, it really adapts to its climate and its soil as well as any other white grape that I've, I've ever worked with. Uh, you think of places like the Swartland of South Africa, but you also think of places like Shalone and you think of places like Pritchard Hill with Chapelet. I mean, these are legendary Chenin Blancs, and you think that Tokelon had a lot of Chenin Blanc planted back, you know, up until the 1950s. And it's a variety that adapts. It's a workhorse variety. I think its only fault is that it's not focused as much on fruit. And it actually has secondary characteristics that, you know, people are dying for in white wines now. But I think, you know, there was a time that we kind of lost that uh, desire to drink wines like that. It's not extremely high impact. And it's, it's, you know, a lot of the whites from the Loire, I think, they're wines that you can chug and you can miss a lot of them because they're very gulpable, but you really need to work to kind of work out the nuances. But that's the fun part about drinking wine, that it's not this complete instant gratification. And I mean, clearly Napa Valley once had a lot of Chenin Blanc planted and, you know, it does extremely well here. And, you know, I think it, it, it suits the valley a lot better than Chardonnay does. So. I don't, I don't know if you know that the first vineyard I ever worked in was Chenin Blanc. I didn't know that. Yeah, down in Merced. And this, these were 12-foot rows. I had my Toyota pickup. I could drive down the rows. And, there, and you needed to because each of the blocks were um, a quarter of a section. So that was a quarter of a square mile. And you drive down. And then if it was really, you know, it, or walking it to check for bugs. Right. That was my job was to check for bugs. I, you'd get underneath the vines like as a canopy and like, hide in the shade. Right. You know, that was the, so that was the Chenin Blanc that, you know, it's like an abomination of Chenin Blanc, right. really, in the sense that it was like, you know, because it has the ability to get big clusters. And so I, I remember the first time I had like a real Chenin Blanc, I was like, no, Chenin Blanc's a good wine? Yeah. Really? I, Chenin Blanc, you know, because we would go, it was Grenache, Chenin Blanc, and French Colombard, and I had no idea that Chenin Blanc was a good wine, was like made good wine. It was a, like an epiphany. Right. And so, you know, every time I hear that word, I'm like, wow, it's actually a good wine. <laughs> I would say, or Grenache, but um, so, so I think the other thing um, a lot of folks don't know is, is that Jill is the most amazing orchardist um, and jam maker um, and lots of other things. But so in addition to grapes, um, you guys farm all sorts of stuff in Napa. So what, you know, what do you particularly love farming here? What what makes it such a kind of a great place for this diversity of uh, of produce? Well, when we moved to Napa, we were living in Davis, and Davis is just kind of a bread part of the breadbasket of America. Really, we were just used to having access to all kinds of fresh produce, amazing farmers market, surrounded by. Uh, farms right in Davis and Napa really just grew grapes when we moved here and it was really hard to find locally grown produce at all 
and uh, we had always wanted to farm. We really always wanted to farm fruit trees, even though we love wine. And um, we had this opportunity to plant a fruit orchard on a place that was a vineyard that was wasn't suitable good good vineyard land. So. The, um, we planted this fruit tree on, on leased land. It was a, a fruit orchard. It was peaches, plums, nectarines, pluots, figs, um, just a variety. And the most amazing fruit. I mean, the reason that Napa grapes grow so well here and the quality is so good, the soil and the climate, you know, the, the hot, warm, sunny days, the cool nights to bring out the flavors, the sunny days to bring out the sugars is exactly why the peaches taste so good here. And we just get such vibrancy in the peaches. But the other thing is, I only sell peaches in in the Napa Valley. I don't export them all, so I pick everything when it's dead ripe. And commercially what happens is, when you pick a peach tree, when 10% of the peaches are ripe, the whole tree is, plant, is, is harvested at once. So everything else is underripe when it's harvested and what I do is I pick just the right fruit from that tree I'll go back to the same tree three or four or five times to just keep picking the fruit as it's ripening and then I bring it all to the restaurants in Napa and the farmers market and it's um, amazing and everything that's not like top quality that goes to for sale as as fruit we turn into jam and uh, we just kind of have fun with the jam we experiment every year. This year we made Cabernet jelly. You know, it was like, why not, you know? <laughs> Under a different name. <laughs> so, um, and I should say, Jill, Jill may have some of the only allocated jam that I've ever seen. So, if you want, you know, exactly. Na Napa Valley allocated jam that uh, doesn't require an alcohol label. <laughs> um, so, uh, Tegan, the other thing that uh, is you are also, I believe, um, a proud landowner in Lodi. Um, so what possibly drew you out there? Well, I, uh, for my day job, we work now with five other vineyards out in Lodi, and uh, Steve worked there as well. and. You know, it really is an area where it's full of farmers, and I think the thing that they're missing, and a lot of people in Lodi give me a lot of uh, grief about it, is that uh, there, there are very few wine growers out in Lodi, people who are actually connected to the final product. So they, they may grow grapes and they grow them for tonnage and sugar, but they're, they're not directly linked to the quality of wine. and. With working for Turley, we realized that you know we farm a vineyard that we lease that we average about three quarters of a ton to the acre, and the vineyard right next to us averages about eleven tons to the acre. And you know, to me, the site you know if the vines were all healthy and young, it probably is an eight, a ton and a half to the acre site. But some people are stretching out eleven tons. So I believe there's a lot of uh, quality vineyards out there that are farmed for. You know, they make really good wine for what they're, they're purposed for, but the, the, the potential for high quality is uh, limitless out there. It just takes, you know, trying to figure out what you're going for and, you know, how you're farming. And if you're farming for sugar, if you want to retain acidity, when you want to pick, and kind of all the, all the questions we go over and over during harvest in your head 24 hours a day. There are a lot of those questions I don't think people go over out there because the questions are how ripe is it and how much fruit is out there. So that, I think that's one of the differences. So tell us a little about, uh, about Kirschenman. So Kirschenman's a vineyard that I bought. Uh, it's in the eastern part of Lodi in the McCallamy River AVA. The vineyard was planted in 1915 by the Kirschenman family. They were... Uh, 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 German immigrants that were from Odessa, Russia, so they were farmers. They came out uh, at the turn of last century through the way of the Dakotas, and there's a big population of German immigrants from Odessa in this part of Lodi. So the neighboring uh, families are the, the Schmieds, the Schmiers, the Bombacks, and uh, it, it, yeah, it, it's a pretty... It's a, it's a pretty neat place because, you know, 
there are about eight eight different families who have been out there since 1907. Uh, and the vineyard's planted on its own roots, planted in 1915, and the, the granddaughter of the original owner sold it to me and my wife last year. <laughs> I don't know. It's also probably really growing grapes now. No, he grows apples and he's very tall. The other neighbor is Canole. I call it Canole, but it's, they call him Noel. No. <laughs> so, so what's what's the one thing that you would love to see us doing in California that we're not doing right now? I have to think about this one because the one thing. Um, well, I kind of mentioned this a little earlier, but the one thing, there's one thing it would be for winemakers to make the wine that they want to make. Which seems like, this seems obvious, doesn't it? But there's, a, a, there's an idea with many people that, they, that there's this, some other out there that you're making wine for. And, um, but when I taste wine made by a winemaker who's, who loves the wine and that's the only thing they want to drink and they're drinking their wine everywhere they go and they bring their wine to dinner with them and they, I, I love those wines. And the character of the person comes to me just as much as the character of the site. And I'd love to see more of that. I really would love to see more of that. I'd love to see more people picking up and saying, I have a vision, I found a piece of ground I love and I'm not going to let anything stand in my way, I'm going to make that wine. Well, and I would I would agree with Steve, and the only difference is that I think people should be proud of where they make wine, and more more than anything, you know, it's it's making wine from a certain region is like having an accent, and certain people when they travel they're embarrassed of their accent, and I think keeping your accent is something that's very very important in California and in the New World. It's something we've lost. We we haven't wanted to. You know, every wine that's made in California has a zip code, it has a place that it's from. And for people to hold their head up high and say, you know what, I'm proud of where this wine's from, and I'm proud of my accent, and I, I want people to understand that, you know, this wine that I make, it, it's an agricultural product. It's, it's not something that's mass produced and sold in a supermarket. Like, this comes from a place, and, you know, if, if it comes from a place that's influenced by the Delta or the Bay Fog, or if it comes from a place that's in, influenced by, you know, the hot Fresno Valley, that's fine, but people embracing where something's from, and I think it really takes consumers to ask the question, like, where is this wine from, and does it fit what I think it should be? Like, you know, should a, should a Merlot from the Sierra Foothills or a Cab Franc taste like a Cabernet from Napa? I don't think so, but you know, some people would make it to taste that way. It just also kind of reminds me that uh, we should just think of more varieties that are appropriate for the climates that we're that we have here. I mean, we have this thing that you've talked about, John. You know, the f the French varieties really caught kind of favor and popularity. But the climate really doesn't, in, in parts of California, aren't the best suited for those varieties. <clears throat> and we have this vineyard um, that, we, that we manage in the Central Valley. It's further east of Napa. It's regularly 105 degrees there for probably 45 days of the summer. And um, the vineyard that we manage is, was Mer planted to Merlot. And there's still Merlot in the neighboring vineyard. We grafted this vineyard over, but the Merlot just suffers. The water is full of boron, and the Merlot just suffers. And we grafted a Vermentino along with a bunch of other stuff. And we went out there to visit it when it was 110 degrees. It was the middle of the day. The Merlot was just like melting. And the Vermentino was like, wahoo, it's a party. I'm loving it here. Like, how much, how more can you bring on, you know? And, and we just, there, there's so many different varieties, and there's so many more that are appropriate for the climate that we have here. And I think there's, there's a real opportunity to explore what we could plant here. So just wrapped up 2013 harvest, kind of fast, quick, relatively easy. So... What do you guys get to do now to uh, take a break? 
Well, uh, my wife and I just had our first son a week ago, so we, we've got a son to take care of. But, you know, I think, no, no. But I think, you know, a lot of people think, oh, harvest is done, but, you know, we're already prepping for bottling. We'll be bottling the first two weeks of December, and we kind of have a couple weeks off right around uh, the Christmas holiday. And then we move into, we, when, when all the guys come back from uh, Christmas break, we start pruning. So, I mean, basically it goes from harvest, get ready for bottling, bottling, decompress from bottling, and then start pruning and the growing season starts all over again. And I mean, I think that's one of the great things about making wine and farming is that it, it keeps you going following a cycle and it's something you can always look forward to. And even though, I mean, I think everyone I know, the last day you pick your grapes, you're already thinking about next year and you're thinking about what you're going to do differently next year. And you're wondering like, wow, it's, it's dry out. Are we going to get enough rain? Is it going to be, should we, you know, leave less positions? Should we leave more positions? Can the, can the grapes really ripen fruit in three drought years? And we've had two large harvests and I mean, and that's like the day you're driving like the last ton of grapes. You haven't even started fermenting them and you're already like, you know, fixating on, on next year. And, and maybe I should be more focused and fixating on the grapes there, but it's just human nature. You already start looking forward to next year. And I think it's a good thing for human beings to always be looking forward to something and not looking behind and thinking about how the last year was, but already thinking about what the next season's going to bring. Well, the old joke is that an old farmer died, and when they did the autopsy, they found that he was full of next year's. <laughs> and so, so you know, so so with next year, so we, you know, we're in the middle right now of putting our cover crops in. You know, after the grapes are off, we plant our cover crops. Those are the you know we plant between the vines. We have our compost coming that we're putting down. Um, we're getting pulling, removing sick vines from the vineyard. But the thing I'm really looking forward to, once that's all done, because I consider harvest, cover crops, compost, stick vines, things like that, is all like the finishing the year. And then we get to put a new floor in the barn. That's a biggie. You get a new floor in the barn, get that done. These are simple pleasures. Very simple, but, you know, get a new floor in the barn. We're looking forward to that all year. Got servicing equipment. Got the trucks already dealt with. Now we just need to deal with the tractors. And then, of course, we have bottling in December. So the, the, the wine life is this cycle. Every day is different, and you have 365 of them, and you just start over. And it just rolls and rolls. It's really fun. Okay, this, this is the glamorous life in Napa. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much for, for coming out and, like I said, for enduring several years' worth of pesky questions for the book. And... Uh, you know, have a fantastic holidays and and serious congratulations to you and Olivia. So, so cheers, guys. Cheers.